Joining me today is an evolutionary psychologist, an author, an associate professor at the University of New Mexico. Jeffrey Miller, welcome to the Rubin Report. Hey Dave, great to be here. Good to be with you, my friend. Uh, you know, I realize I've had evolutionary biologists on the show. I've had Brett Weinstein mm -hmm. and Richard Dawkins. I've had psychologists on the show, Jordan Peterson. I've never had an evolutionary psychologist. Never. No. First. There aren't very many of us. <laughs> how many of, How many <laughs> are there? We're almost extinct. Yeah. Um, the big international conference, we get maybe 300 people. Versus like a big neuroscience conference will be 30,000. That's gotta be a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd. Um, we get a lot of flack from all directions, but I, I, would, I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's an, it's an awesome field. And um, I can't imagine anything more fun than studying human nature for a living. Yeah, and you're studying and have written about so many incredible topics. I normally, I always, I'm pri I pride myself on the fact mm -hmm. that I usually don't have to look at my notes when interviewing somebody, but you've mm -hmm. hit so many things that every now and again, I am gonna be glancing down because I don't want to miss anything here. But usually the way I like to start these is mm -hmm. just finding out a little bit of someone's history, what sort of brought them to the place of expertise that gets them in that chair. So just tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, growing up, education, that sort of thing. What, what made you interested in all this? Oh, I was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. Went to undergrad at Columbia University. I studied psychology and biology and just anything that grabbed my interest. So I kind of started out in neuroscience and I thought the brain's fascinating. And then I kind of drifted into cognitive psychology, which is studying human learning and memory and perception and how we categorize stuff. And then I got really bored with that. But I thought, I don't, I don't know, I'll go, I'll go PH, do a PhD in that anyway. So I went to Stanford, started doing cognitive psychology. But when I was there, I met uh, these two brilliant um, postdocs who were working with my advisor, Lita Cosmides and John Tuohy, who had just come from Harvard. And they basically invented the field of evolutionary psychology right there at Stanford in front of my nose hmm. from the ground up. And they were like, we're gonna take evolutionary biology, anthropology, cognitive psychology, merge them all together and make this new science of human nature. Yeah, so let's slow down for a second. So how, what does that synth <clears throat> synthesis look like? What does that even mean when they're yeah. talking about this? How do you take these things that are thought of as their own institutions and, and you know, put them into one box? It's basically like the, the key insight is if you wanna understand human nature, whether it's anything, human sexuality or emotions or how we relate to other people or other groups, you can always ask the question, where did we come from? What challenges did our ancestors face in terms of surviving and reproducing and raising kids? And what exact structure did those challenges have? Like, what was ancestral life like? We don't know every, every detail, but we do know a lot from anthropologists who have studied hunter-gatherers. We know a lot from primatologists who have studied um, chimps and bonobos and, and, and gorillas and orangutans. And you can kind of triangulate on a picture of prehistoric life and figure out, yeah, like why do we fear certain things, snakes and spiders and bears and whatever? Well, it's because th there were certain selection pressures. Like if you don't fear those things, you die. Mm -hmm. Why do we look for certain things in mates when we're choosing sexual partners? Well, if you don't look for those things, then you have bad relationships and bad kids, et cetera. So it's a, a way of looking at the past to inform our understanding of the present. Um, and that's not what most of psychology does, so it's quite a novel kind of approach, but mm -hmm. I think we've got, we've got an enormous leverage out of it. Was there pushback from people within each discipline going, whoa, 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 we've got all the answers right here, why do we wanna put these things together? Because I would imagine there's always a certain inherent mm -hmm. competition amongst all of these different disciplines. Yeah, the evolutionary biologists kind of hate it yeah. because <laughs> that was like, going to be my next question. Since I know those, a couple of those guys, they're happy to go. Here's how other animals evolve. They're happy to go. Here's how the human body evolved. Here's how the human immune system evolved. But once you get above the neck, then they're like, you're just going to make trouble for us in biology because that's where things get politically controversial. Mm -hmm. Is when you start explaining human behavior or individual differences or sex differences or human emotions or stuff like that. So the biologists don't like it. The anthropologists had a lot of the same issues. Like 
we've spent the last century trying to get anthropology kind of away from biology in a way. So please don't drag us kicking and screaming back into that, yeah. that swamp of, of controversy. Um, but we just kind of, kind of plowed ahead and, um, and I think it's been a big success story in, in the sciences in the last 30 years. So what were the things that were intriguing to you that had sort of bored you from the other disciplines before that? <clears throat> I think the, the fact that sexuality is central to evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology, you know, it's how, how we get our genes in the next generation is choosing mates and having babies and raising, raising kids. And if you ignore that, you ignore, I think, one of the core driving forces in human nature and human culture. Now, most of psychology kind of ignores uh, mate choice and sexuality and reproduction, um, except insofar as it's kind of like seen as politically relevant. So like you'll get a little bit on, well, there's sexual discrimination against certain kind of groups, which is important to address, mm -hmm. like gay and lesbian rights and, and so forth. Um, but they don't really see it as central to um, who we are and to what motivates us. So do you see it as, as the real pillar of what's motivating us? Like if we were sort of looking at this in, in concentric circles. I think it depends where you're at in life. I think mm -hmm. for young single people, what we call mating effort, like the attempt to attract other people, whatever your sexual orientation, that drives an awful lot of behavior. How you dress, what I ideas you adopt, um, why you bother to learn things, why you bother to get credentials. I think a lot of that is driven by mating effort. But then if you settle down and you're in a long-term monogamous relationship, you don't kind of need to do that stuff. But that's exactly when people get lazy. Go, huh? That's where people let themselves go, right? Um, they don't stay in shape, they dress more sloppily, they kind of don't bother reading like serious nonfiction anymore. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because a lot of that sort of creative display has already accomplished its, its purpose. So in that way, that's not in real conflict with evolutionary mm -hmm. biology, right? Because you want to look your best to get the best mate yeah. and all that. So in, in that way, you guys are on the same track. So where does that, where does that deviate? Well, so when biologists talk about courtship displays, and here's the bower bird building its bower, and we talk about like ideological displays, and mm -hmm. here's people showing off like their virtues through virtue signaling, the biologists know exactly what we're talking about. And we know exactly what they're talking about. It's just often they don't want to get in the trouble that, that follows if they kind of make these analogies too clearly. Have you had any of these conversations with Brett Weinstein? Not directly. Yeah. No. All right. I, I think I, I'm going to have I, to facilitate that one probably. That would, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah we'll, yeah. we'll do that for sure. So it's interesting. Okay. So let's, let's focus on the sexuality part mm -hmm. of this for a little bit because it seems like so many things that we used to be able to talk about, mm -hmm. we suddenly can't talk about or that academics are self-selecting out of and things of that nature. Now, I said to you yeah. right before we started, you're one of the few people I see on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, he kind of gets what Twitter is because you put out mm -hmm. some smart stuff, you're kind of mm -hmm. funny on there at the right time, you know when mm -hmm. to go with snark and all of those things. And that to me seems the only way that you would be able to have any of these conversations online. I think social media is actually really good for addressing some of these very tricky issues like human sexuality and how it's playing out in the modern world. As long as you do it with humor and self-deprecation and a little bit of absurdity, which is what I try to do in my Twitter game, yeah. right? Because if you approach it like, well, here's the next paper on like sex differences or the next paper on how courtship works or, mm. oh, awesome, a new virtue signaling paper, people will quickly tune out and they'll often, often think, well, you're just kind of being doctrinaire here. But the thing you quickly realize if you study evolution at all is evolution is a very weird process that often produces completely absurd results, right? You watch any David Attenborough natural history, you know, documentary and it's like, these animals are insane. What they're doing is crazy <laughs> and humans are no different. Yeah. And if you don't have a sense of that absurdity, 
then it's very easy to get terribly, terribly serious and censorious and ideological. And that really captures that, a lot that of that doesn't, what's going on. Right? That doesn't really help anybody. Yeah. All right. So let's let's pause on sexuality for a second. I don't want to get off that topic, so mm -hmm. to speak. But um, let's just do the two minute uh, Twitter <laughs> portion of the show, yeah. which is: Is there a evolutionary explanation to the way we're behaving with each other? Is there a psychological? explanation to the way we act one way on this medium and another way on another medium and and how that has evolved because of the yeah. types of communication it's a great question and i think honestly social media blindsided everybody i don't know anybody in the 90s in psychology or any behavioral science who's going here's what the internet is going to turn into hmm. right it'll become this massive global system of very rapid fire, interactive, snarky virtue signaling <laughs> that drives everyone nuts and yet we can't give it up. Yeah, I nobody, think Philip K. Dick probably would have right. thought that, but maybe it, nobody else. Yeah, Philip K. Dick, maybe William Gibson, uh, a few other folks kind of had the insight, but honestly nobody was deriving kind of from first principles. Well, mm -hmm. we are a social primate and we love to gossip and we love to show off you know, our, our virtues and our intelligence to each other. And therefore, obviously, there will be this thing called Facebook and Twitter and whatever. And it will play out in this way. And moreover, it will revolutionize politics or culture in some way. Mm -hmm. No, Nobody thought that. So we can come up with post hoc reasons why that might have played out that way. Um, but I would only do that with a very high degree of humility. Like, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. It, now that we're here, you can kind of a little bit make sense of it. That Well, it's almost like you can see the evolution of mm. Twitter. You know what I mean? Where you now see people, I'd like to include myself in that, where they're trying to clean mm. it up a little bit. It's yeah. like we all did this unknown thing of snark and everyone was trying mm -hmm. to destroy each other and one up each other and virtue yeah. signal about the things we care about and all that. And it's like now I'm seeing a growing group of people that are like, whoa, how do we deal with reality in mm -hmm. the confines of social media, but, but mm -hmm. maturely and honestly and without just wrecking everything. And that almost strikes me as an evolutionary yeah. function. And it's evolution that's happening so fast and on such a huge scale. I mean, who could have predicted that, like, the more amateurish looking a visual meme <laughs> is, the better it would spread? Uh -huh. That's completely bizarre. Um, or the fact that I can get more engagement if I do a really surreal poll on Twitter about something where all four categories are just completely insane. <laughs> like, people are more into that right. than they are, like, even my snarky comment about s political issue X or Y. So what does that tell you about the psychological state of how we interact with these things? The, like the meme one's really interesting. It's not the slickly yeah. produced, yeah. quick thing, you know, really sharp mm -hmm. looking images that go viral. It's, you know, a frog on a black and white idiotic thing or a crudely drawn yeah. this or that tree or whatever. Like there, there's something really there to that the, about how we react to images. This, there's also something kind of charming about the artlessness and amateurish quality. It's almost like if I'm kind of fascinated by stand-up comedy and the stand-up comedians who are overly slick are never that funny. Mm -hmm. And the ones who are a little bit shambolic, like Stephen Wright back in the 80s, mm -hmm. hilarious. And he looks, he looks like he's always on the edge of complete failure or a psychotic break. <laughs> and yet right. that's what makes it work or I guess Seinfeld, you know, in the 90s, um, the show was also mm -hmm. kind of had this artless quality. Yeah. All right. So let's jump and back so to sexuality true. now. Okay. Yeah. It's getting harder and harder to talk <clears throat> about these things. There's a set of people that think we're all exactly the same. And then at mm -hmm. the same time, they're obsessed with all of our differences. I mean, this is yeah. what seemingly is the most potent idea of the day right now. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what are the things that you're thinking about in, in the realm of sexuality right now that are intriguing? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, 
I'm especially concerned about the fact that nobody seems to know what a successful long-term relationship is seriously going to look like in the early to mid 21st century, that we don't really have a script for that. We've kind of inherited, you know, the script of monogamous lifelong marriage, but nobody really believes that that is going to kind of solve all of our problems. And people don't ent enter into that very early in life. They spend their teens and 20s doing casual dating. What is that? Like, nobody quite understands what the, the rules or the ethics of that are. And that at a certain point, you kind of get tired of that and you find a partner and you kind of settle down and go, okay, we're going to buy into the wedding industry now and do the wedding thing and the ring and blah, blah, blah. But there are all these subcultures in America and around the world that are exploring all different aspects of sexuality and kind of how to incorporate new insights into relationships. Things like um, BDSM or kink or polyamory and open relationships or the whole red pill manosphere subculture. Um, and then on the other side of the... What does that have to do with sexuality? <clears throat> well, it's a certain way of, of men and women interacting, right? The sort of red pill vision of male-female dynamics is that there's a really deep sexual polarity, mm -hmm. masculine and feminine. And if you don't understand that polarity, your relationships, if, if they're heterosexual, are going to fail and burn out and not be satisfying to either person. So there's a bunch of subcultures. They're all uh, exploring different parts of human nature, human sexuality, different possible ways to run a relationship. And I think they all have valuable lessons that we can kind of learn and incorporate. Like even if you're vanilla and monogamous and straight and you, you don't believe all the, the crazy manosphere stuff, there's still important lessons there. And that's kind of my interest now is sort of going around and, and being eclectic and gathering those up and figuring out which, which of those might be useful. Do people stay in those scenes mm -hmm. for, for a lifetime? So, I, you know, I can see where, where somebody, you'd be in any, whatever your thing is, and I'm not passing judgment mm -hmm. on anybody. Whatever your thing is, you do it for mm -hmm. a while. And then eventually, I guess it sort of is the, then you sort of get tired of it, so you move on to something more traditional. Like, is that just part of our psychology? Like, nothing kind of lasts forever. Some people do that. Certainly, there's a, there's a life profile of kind of openness and experimentation where you, you try a bunch of stuff in your teens and 20s, and a lot of it deviates markedly from the traditional culture you, you grow up in. And a lot of that... Um, hurts and it doesn't work and it's heartbreaking and then you a lot of people kind of drift back into the mainstream on the other hand you got people who marry young and they try the the standard vanilla monogamy thing into their 30s 40s 50s and then go this is not working i need something different better more open whatever and i think um it can go either way you know the psychological research on all these subcultures is lacking. Mm -hmm. We don't know even which lasts longer, a monogamous relationship or an open relationship. Everybody, we, really don't, we, don't, we don't know. know. There's not good data on that. Huh. There's lots of anecdotes. There's examples on both sides. But I think it's almost scientific misconduct not to ask those questions and instead to ask like, let's do you know, study on which alcoholism treatment works. Let's do the 5,000th study on that before we do the first study on what kind of relationships last longest. So basically because you think if we could address some of those issues first, perhaps mm -hmm. the studies that we're focusing on related to alcoholism, well, alcoholism and the rest. Yeah. Relationship satisfaction is really, really important to people. Um, but it's one of the, the things that's, it's not entirely taboo, to study it, but it's pretty hard to get federal research funding to look at something that's kind of a cornerstone of American well-being. So when that New York Times article came out about Jordan Peterson and they said mm -hmm. he was for enforced monogamy, mm -hmm. which in effect just means marriage, and it had been used a couple times in the Times before just to mean marriage, but yeah. everyone, everyone thought that meant he wanted women mm -hmm. in chains 
to be you know dragged around by their husbands. The the argument that people that are for <laughs> for monogamy or marriage basically make is that this is the best way to build a sort of functioning, healthy mm-hmm. society and that you can reproduce and have other generations and all of those things. You just think we don't have enough information, basically, or enough, um, right. well, enough study on the information to, to know if that really is the best way to build a human society. Right. We don't know. There's, there's good reasons to think that um, monogamous marriage has been important in every major civilization. Like it's kind of the most common way to arrange pair bonding. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure Jordan Peterson has read the same articles I've assigned even in my polyamory class that's about here are the benefits of monogamous marriage and there are many benefits of it. The question is once you have contraception, once you have safer sex and STI testing, once you have paternity testing, once you have a lot of other um, technologies, right, that can solve some of the same issues that monogamy used to solve, then what? Is monogamy still optimal? Mm-hmm. Probably is for a lot of people. Probably is for a lot of people. How much of it do you think just comes down to how you're wired? I think there's a lot of that. Some people are just wired to go, man, I just want a pair bond. I want my mate and I want to keep it simple and that's good enough for me. and. I will get a lot of companionate love and attachment and it'll last a long time. A lot of people are very happy with that and that's great. But a lot of people either want more sexual novelty and variety or they have a higher tolerance for sexual jealousy um, <clears throat> or they just kind of get bored in long-term relationships. Mm-hmm. And I think those people should not be prescribing like rampant polyamory for the monogamists, but the monogamist shouldn't necessarily be prescribing like our way is the only way for everybody else. Hmm. So I wonder how this is all related to the gay community because I don't know, Mm -hmm. dare I mention the name Milo, but when I had Milo on my show years ago, really before he was Milo, Mm -hmm. so to speak, um, we got in, we had about a half hour chat on this where me as the married gay liberal and him Mm -hmm as the unmarried gay conservative, which mm-hmm. is already sort of a flip on things, yeah. his argument was that he wasn't really for gay marriage because he felt mm-hmm. that by being the outsider, the gays have yeah. come up with art and creativity and music and comedy and mm-hmm. all of those, th- that incredible, like just gestalt of it all that made this incredible community, yeah. like a diverse community in the right sense of diversity. Yeah. And my argument was, well, you've got to at least give people the opportunity mm-hmm. to be equal under the law so that they at least have a choice. I'm not denying that the gay community has come up with all sorts of incredible stuff, yeah. but like you got to make them equal and then let them go either way on that. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you think there is legitimacy to that? And do you, have you done or have you seen any studies on mm-hmm what the effects of, the, uh, of marriage on the gay community have been? I haven't seen a whole lot. but I, I guess it's my, probably too soon, right? I mean, my understanding, and some of this comes from Dan, Dan Savage, right, is that a lot of gay couples have a kind of monogamish relationship where it's like we're pair bonded, we love each other, but there's also a negotiated agreement that we can have outside lovers once in a while under certain conditions that we kind of mutually agree to. See, it's funny. I hear that all the time and I don't know, out of the gay mm-hmm. couples that I know that are mm-hmm. that are married or, you know, really yeah. together, I don't know ones that are like that or at least that I know that they are mm-hmm. like that. Let's put it that way. Okay. But but I know that this is uh, something that's tossed out there. Yeah. So, so we can go with this for... So, but I'm sure there's variety and yeah. I'm sure that there's also kind of social assortment, right? So that the more monogamous gay or lesbian couples will kind of be more comfortable with each other mm-hmm. and they might know those crazy monogamish <laughs> folks down the road. Right. But, um, or you just don't know your friends that well. I mean, <laughs> I yeah. guess anything's possible, yeah. Yeah, and honestly it's not that different from like the way um, even heterosexual relationships work in a lot of Europe mm-hmm. where a lot of those are tacitly monogamish and there's a sort of understanding that um, Monogamy doesn't necessarily mean sexual exclusivity for either partner. Um, America is extremely puritanical and kind of rigid about that. And we think um, anything that happens outside the pair bond is 
almost by definition unethical. Um, and there is research on sort of anti-polyamory stigma, mm -hmm. where people actually are more prejudiced against people in open relationships mm -hmm. than they are against almost any other group um, in terms of orientation or race or religion or, or anything. Um, that might be gradually changing, but I think it's a, it's a huge social problem, especially among Gen Z and younger millennials. Yeah. Where does the trans part of this all fit in? Because I remember years ago when people would say, when, I, when everyone started saying the LGBT community, mm -hmm. I remember thinking, I have no more insight into the T part of this mm -hmm. than a straight, cisgendered, heterosexual male would. You know what I mean? I, I just, I yeah. don't. I, I, maybe I have somehow slightly a little more inherent empathy by being mm -hmm. an outsider at some level, but I don't have any more knowledge of it. And now it seems like the trans issue has almost superseded all of the other issues, at least in the last year. I mean, everywhere, yeah. everywhere you go, there's, you know, every time I open the Twitter search bar, it's another trans story, or you know, someone's being fired for this joke or that or the other thing. <clears throat> what, what do you think happened there that catapulted this so quickly? And what are the issues around it that we're kind of afraid to talk about right now? It's a really complicated, fraught topic. Well, but that's why I'm think, trying to get you in trouble, so go like, <laughs> The legitimate issue about trans is there are people who um, are trans or feel trans and they want their rights respected and that's totally legitimate mm -hmm. and, and good for them. And raising awareness about that is fine. There's a much larger group of people who I think are using trans issues as a kind of wedge to destroy uh, the gender binary, or to kind of muddy the waters, or basically as a weapon to beat up evolutionary psychology hmm. or evolutionary biology, to say there's no such thing as sex, really. There's no such thing as biological sex, or sex is totally dissociated from gender, et cetera. So when someone says that, and the next time someone says that mm -hmm. on Twitter, what's the answer that, that the person watching this should give? That Maybe Twitter's not the best forum for it. I mean... Male and female are evolved strategies that exist because over thousands of generations, they were like the paths to successful reproduction. Um, if you're not clearly male and functioning as a male, or you're not clearly female and functioning as a female, you're, you're a genetic dead end. So selection hammers against any ambiguity there. So it's not surprising that the vast majority of humans alive today clearly identify as one sex or the other. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean everyone should. It doesn't have any kind of moral implications about that. But just descriptively, it means there is a gender binary and it evolved for good reasons. And everyone who teaches biology hopefully knows this. And it shouldn't be that for controversial, now. right? <laughs> Now, if we want to like genetically engineer people and use CRISPR and whatever to destroy the gender binary for the 22nd and 23rd centuries, we could do that. We could talk about that. Um, I don't have any particular attachment to the kind of male-female dichotomy ethically. Um, but I think descriptively, it's really important to kind of accept it and, and to go, it, it's here, it's valuable to understand, and we shouldn't necessarily try to pretend it out of existence um, or pretend that we're doing it in the name of trans rights. Right? You can right. have trans rights without saying there's no such thing as sex. So this gets to the heart of what I think is really happening in this country right now, which is everything has become politicized to the point that the experts in the field seem afraid to talk about these <clears throat> issues. You right now are, are taking a risk by talking mm -hmm. about these issues. Yeah. Are you seeing this across the board? Are you, are you seeing this amongst colleagues, a fear to talk about these things? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the vast majority of people, like at my university, don't really touch upon anything that's particularly politicized, right? They're just teaching civil engineering or law or um, immunology or whatever. And most of that isn't really politicized yet. However, 
yet is the key word. Yeah, there, right. Right. Yeah, okay. It, I mean, you get a little bit bit about what's the gender representation in certain fields, but in my department in psychology, you do get almost everything having a kind of political edge. And I have colleagues who are frightened to teach certain classes. Like I teach psychology of human sexuality, and I'm, I'm pretty upfront and outspoken about what I cover and, and what my view is, but a lot of my colleagues will not touch it with a barge pole because there's so much risk that students will just get upset about one little thing you say yeah. and complain to a dean, and then you'll get called into the office and... Um, so what would be that type of thing, beyond what you just said about the need yeah. and the evidence of, of gender mm -hmm. differences, what, what are the other type of things that just talking about are scaring the academics? It's very awkward to talk about sex differences in any mental traits or motivations or preferences. It's hard to talk about sexual coercion, rape, date rape, harassment, stalking, mm -hmm. et cetera. That must be an incredibly difficult one at college. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard to talk about um, aggression in general, either between individuals or between groups, and how that relates to sexuality. Like why hunter-gatherer tribes go to war, right? It's not typically about land or food, it's about women. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't fit the kind of Marxist picture of prehistoric warfare, mm -hmm. right? And then if you talk about stuff like um, pregnancy, childcare, parenting, are you being you know, overly pronatalist and sort of family values for talking about that stuff? Mm -hmm. Is that alienating to certain students who might be homosexual or infertile or, or adopted kids or whatever? Um, so it's so interesting because I obviously hear these types of stories from mm -hmm. academics all the time, not only in here, but, but online, and people email me all the time, mm -hmm. and it's like, God, we've failed. I mean, the universities mm -hmm. really have failed at that point. Like, if you're afraid to talk about child rearing because that might upset a gay person, yeah, Jesus, I mean, w what's left at that point? It's so frustrating, and it means... I feel bad for the students, but I also feel bad for the parents who are often footing the tuition yeah. bill. Because the parents have faith that if I send my kid to a state university and I pay tens of thousands in tuition, and they take a course on topic X, like human sexuality, that they're going to get professors who are willing to profess to say what they really think. And often they're not getting that. So there's a kind of bait and switch where universities are pretending to be these bastions of free speech and inquiry and, and honesty. And in fact, um, everyone's kind of running scared and these kids are not getting our best insights. They're paying the money, but we're not delivering the service. How much of an infection, not just in the classroom, do you see this as, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you've written around 110 published papers, is that right? Did I get the exact number right? Is it 100? More or less. More, yeah. more, more or less. You lose count yeah. at some point. Um, I'm sure you're well aware of the Peter Bogosian mm -hmm. led Sokol hoax, mm -hmm. that it's not just what's happening in the classroom that's causing the chaos, but it actually may be what's happening before that related yeah. to all of these papers mm -hmm. that at certain disciplines basically have, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm overestimating, they almost have no standards yeah. at this point. That, that has got to be just incredibly frustrating for someone that actually has published some things legitimately. It, it's kind of frustrating, but... I can see it, you don't get frustrated easily, but... Um, like, it doesn't bug me as much as maybe it bugs some other people. Partly because I spent a lot of my undergraduate um, years taking courses on critical theory, and I read a lot of Derrida and Foucault and Lyotard and all those French dudes, and... One reason I loved those courses is it was so easy to get an A yeah. by writing a <laughs> kind of <laughs> bullshit paper using the right terms uh -huh. <clears throat> and using sufficiently obscure syntax, right? That, uh, so I know that game. God, that's real. It's very really well. Real, it's really thing. real. Yeah. And it's great fun. I understand the appeal <laughs> of that stuff. It's just I can't imagine spending my adult life doing nothing but that. 
And that's what's happening in a lot of the humanities. So it, like, if, if those folks want to do that and, and get paid typically not a very good salary to do that, I don't, it doesn't really viscerally offend me. Mm -hmm. The only danger is when, is when they turn into activists and they give people like me grief based on not understanding what I do. Yeah. Well, I would imagine a lot of it just then leaks into your classroom and then, then all bets are off. It's weird, it doesn't actually leak in. No? Like when I teach human sexuality, right? The kids have a sort of vague um, political correctness that they've absorbed mostly in K through 12 public school, I think. But if you actually ask them, have you had any courses on gender feminism? No. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of any of these leading figures from critical theory or history of feminism or even history of gay rights they know nothing about? So it's not like they've been indoctrinated, at least not in big state schools, but they've kind of soaked up some stuff from high school, I think, hmm. that influences how they interpret everything. So as two guys wearing, might I say, very nice shirts right now, a shiny purple shirt and a shiny blue shirt, mm -hmm. let's talk about evolutionary aesthetics. Cool. People don't talk about aesthetics yeah. that much, but you think that sort of the things we're looking at in the West are maybe not as exciting as they should be and that there's a problem there. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I've been really into art for a long time, and I think art and beauty are important, um, particularly the places people live and work. And I think as humans, we kind of deserve the best from artists, interior designers, um, stylists, whatever, architects that make our lives as pleasant as possible. And I think basically ever since about 1910, art and architecture has failed hmm. and has not done a very good job of delivering visual environments that are actually humane and appealing and enjoyable and that kind of promote mental and physical health. What happened around 1910? Modernism, man. <laughs> um, if you look at the way domestic architecture worked up until about that period, it was all sort of human scale and arts and crafts. And um, there are places you'd want to live where you didn't have to be educated into a particular elite notion of what a house should be in order to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you get the Bauhaus, international modernism, white structures, crisp hard lines, um, bad acoustics, and suddenly that becomes the fashion, mm -hmm. right? That becomes what people think are is the future, and nobody likes it. Yeah, but it's kind of imposed top down by the elite. You must live like this, like it or not. Is, is that top down for, from the elite or is that just that often those things are just easier to build probably and cheaper to build? Or maybe that's the same thing actually. Well, the irony is like, you could have taken cheap, easy to build reinforced concrete structures mm -hmm. and built a lot of awesome cheap houses that were okay. Or you could do the traditional route. But instead what you get is every house must be distinct and must have its own shape. Mm -hmm. And there can't be any um, standardization. So the houses end up being expensive and experimental and hard to maintain and they leak and everyone's miserable. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not really serving the needs of the, the people at large. They're just great for architect egos. Yeah, it's interesting because I just spent a couple of months bouncing through a lot of different countries in Europe, and mm -hmm. you know, especially in, well, in most of these countries because the history goes back so far. You see yeah. incredible architecture. You see even mm -hmm. you know I see chairs that were mm -hmm. 150 years old, and like the woodwork that would go into it and the craftsmanship, mm -hmm. and it was like I don't think we could do this today, or if we could do it today, mm -hmm. this would this chair would be in our dollars. It would be like a six thousand five hundred dollar chair where yeah. back then. You know, this is what a guy did. It mm -hmm. took him a couple days and he could sell it and mm -hmm. earn a wage. And it's like, we've just, the economics of everything have gotten out of whack. Yeah, and like, nice table here. Yeah. And this slab, probably, this is, this is the new, the you slab. commented on the table right when you walked in, so I know you mean it. Yeah. Um, I've made a 
few pieces of furniture in my day, and that, that's pretty cool. But yeah, it was the visual art in particular. Um, the economics mean, like, abstract painting just is so much faster to do than representational painting, right? If you're a young aspiring artist and you want a career and you want to give your gallery a certain flow of work that they can sell, it's a lot harder to do that if you're doing representational paintings mm -hmm. that take 100, 300 hours than mm -hmm. an abstract work that takes a tenth of that. So the economic pressures are also in that direction. Yeah. Um, but people have um, kind of voted with their feet and like they don't like elite abstract art. They don't like conceptual art. Um, but is, is like the word the right word there, or they just don't <laughs> they just don't know, or it's conditioning, or it's that we all like to like what everybody else likes, sort of thing. I think everybody knows that they're kind of supposed to enjoy going to like. Well, we're visiting this city. We should go to the Contemporary Art Museum, and they get there, mm. and there's a bunch of terrible video art, <laughs> and there's a bunch of very puzzling conceptual art. And they read the little descriptions on the walls and they go, this makes no sense because it's written by an art curator for other art curators. Mm -hmm. And it's all completely alienating. And that's, that's sad because it means they're being told this is the highest expression of your culture, but it's completely inaccessible to you. So what, uh, what do you look at that gives you some excitement or can still sort of renew your spirit, let's say. Well, there, there is a movement of kind of neo-traditionalism in, in art, hmm. where there's, there's certain places like New York Academy of Arts that are actually teaching students how to draw and paint and sculpt and, and do the sort of traditional um, skills that people associate with art. Um, it's just a little hard to get a foothold in the, like the New York or London gallery system mm -hmm. if that's the kind of work that you do. Um, but my hope is that like the Bay Area billionaires will start collecting that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Chinese art market is, has got a real thirst for good representational art. Mm. And I think that's going to start to dominate the art world pretty soon. So what's the evolutionary need mm -hmm. for good art? I mean, what's the psychological? I mean, I know you're, you're, you're okay. There's an expression of something that yeah. can't quite be said, but what's like the, the driving force behind that? So yeah, on the one hand, there's why do we bother to make art? On the other hand, why, why do we like certain kinds of art? Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot more research on why do we like certain kinds of patterns and colors and forms and compositions and whatever. But there's no sort of unified theory of, of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say there's more good stuff published on that topic between about 1870 and 1920 than since. Because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. when people were sort of very inspired by Darwin. Evolutionary aesthetics was a field. There were dozens of books published on it. And then modernism came and everyone forgot all that. How could this be connected to the earlier topic, which is sexuality? So for example, my mm -hmm. gay male friends, generally yeah. speaking, Mm -hmm. have a much better eye for art or for style or for fashion, Yeah, you know? <clears throat> you could get away in that crew, you know what I mean? Like, you got a nice Thank jacket you. on, you got a nice shirt, like that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, that is a compliment. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. where, gen again, just broadly speaking, it's like my straight guy friends all kind of wear big shirts and they don't know exactly how to do their hair and they're, you know? So there's some yeah. connection between sexuality and artistic mm -hmm. vision. I think that's absolutely true, and it's not what you would predict from first principles. It's really weird. If you look around at other species, the males are typically much more ornamented mm -hmm. than the females. Mm -hmm. They have the, the amazing plumage, and they do the incredible songs and dances, and the females are usually kind of drab and, and not that aesthetic. The bowerbirds that make these incredible kind of installation works, that's all the males. Then you get to humans, or at least American males, American straight males, and it's like, can't you even find clothes that fit? <laughs> or like colors that work? It's the big shirt. And like, what is 
up with your house, you know? And when I did well, the- this is um, why Jordan Peterson sold two million copies to tell people to clean mm -hmm. their room. Yeah. So I have no idea why gay men have better taste than straight men. I think that's a fascinating There's issue. some, there has to be some There's link something there. going yeah. on there. Um, but I think men can level up, obviously, because like British and European men aren't as hopeless. If you grow up a young man in Italy, you kind of absorb some ideas about style. And even the British um, kind of aristocrats, landed gentry class, ha have a certain look that it's a bit traditionalist, but at least there's taste. I don't know if this is going to quite make sense, but were we almost getting there, say, 10 years ago with the rise mm -hmm. of the metrosexual? Yeah. And then it sort of crashed because I guess maybe it mm -hmm. relates back to what you said at the beginning about where we are more Puritan. So where yeah. there was this idea, there was this like mocking of them, like, ah, they're just mm -hmm. gay, but don't want mm -hmm. to admit it or something like that. And that whole thing seemed to crash. Like there yeah. was this little brief window where straight guys were like dressing better or yeah. had cooler haircuts or something, something there. Well, even five years ago when I lived in New York for a, a little bit and uh, I hung out, uh, hung out a lot in Brooklyn, there was sort of, that was peak hipster in, in Brooklyn. And the guys there, the straight guys, put a lot of effort into grooming and haircuts and authentic style and like, this or that is in fashion. And I thought, this is really cool. This is like a Europeanization of male taste and culture. But it was also very masculine. Mm -hmm. It wasn't sort of like late 70s disco culture or early 90s rave culture mm -hmm. or or Burning Man culture. It was sort of more old school masculine. It was old like school, yeah. like I want to go to a proper barber and get a proper haircut. Yeah. And like it's all flannel and boots and whatever. And I love that stuff. Um, but I think it kind of had its moment. Uh, and evaporated, I don't know. It's I think in that every, case, they just priced themselves out of the market in Brooklyn, right. probably, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Or they just got all too busy on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, that it always <laughs> comes back to that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about mate selection. Mm -hmm. Regardless of your, of your sexuality, there seems to be this new thing right now where if you're not open to dating absolutely anyone under mm -hmm. any circumstances, no matter how they look or how they take care of themselves or whether they brush their teeth mm -hmm. or whether they have a penis or a vagina mm -hmm. or any combination of anything, that if you aren't just open to anything, there's mm -hmm. a, a pretty loud and growing voice out there that is trying to frame everyone as a, as a yeah. bigot, yeah. which is the reverse of what choosing mm -hmm. a mate really has been about. It's insane. I mean, for 500 million... <laughs> All right, million, I got you. I got emotional <laughs> Miller. There we for go. 500 million years, right, our vertebrate ancestors have been choosing their mates selectively because that is the highest stakes decision any organism makes is who do I recombine my genes with, right? And so all the way through the chordates and the vertebrates and the mammals and the primates, you get particularly females being choosy about you know, who they breed with, who sires their kids. But then as soon as humans start doing pair bonds, million, two million years ago, and the males start investing more in offspring, start forming longer term relationships, then we also have incentives to be choosy about our female mates. And so this is the one domain where if you have even a, a shred of libertarian in you, or you respect freedom of association at all, or you think it's okay to care who you spend your life with and like what kind of children you, you create, then mate choice should be a kind of domain of freedom. Right, like this is a good place to be prejudiced, so to speak, right? Yeah. Like you should have some uh, You should be, dis be discriminating, yeah. have judgment. Discriminating um, taste. And you can always be open to the idea that maybe the current set of criteria that I have maybe could be nudged or improved or tweaked, or maybe I'm subject to certain stereotypes and maybe I could overcome those. True, of course, people tend to get better at mate choice in their 30s than in their teens. But for someone to start lecturing you politically, like, you shouldn't be attracted to women. You should be attracted to anybody or any any kind of being or in what any species, any age. Like, 
No, let, please let me be attracted to who I'm attracted to. Because that should be like the, the pinnacle of human freedom. Yeah. If, if you don't believe in freedom anywhere else, you should believe in mate choice freedom. It should be a fundamental human right, I think. And where you get horrible totalitarian societies really infringing on mate choice freedom, like you're not allowed to marry that person, or you, know, you have to do an arranged marriage to that person, we kind of recoil at that and go, that's horrible. And yet in America, we have busybodies and virtue signalers um, telling us your mate choice criteria are too narrow. So where do gay people fit in all of this then? Mm -hmm. At a biological or an evolutionary perspective, you've brought up the point of passing on genes many times. <coughs> now mm -hmm. gay couples or mm -hmm. gay people, whether you're a couple or not, don't mm -hmm. do that, at mm -hmm. least biologically speaking. Yep. Um, so what, what do you make of that condition? Is that even the right word? Now I'm gonna get I'm gonna get us both in trouble probably just for me asking the question. And... Let's call it a trait. Trait. Trait's pretty neutral. Okay. All right, trait's pretty neutral. Well, here's a fascinating thing about homosexuality is people have been developing or trying to develop theories of male homosexuality and its kind of evolutionary origins and functions for 30, 40 years. And there is no good theory of it yet. It's a complete mystery. I've never seen any compelling explanation of male homosexuality. So, so what would be a compelling argument? A compelling or, argument yeah. would be, okay, there's costs of being like exclusively attracted to your own sex and therefore not typically having as many kids, mm -hmm. but there's some countervailing benefits of some sort, maybe benefits to your extended family or benefits to your group or something else, but nobody can make the math work. Hmm enough to, to kind of explain that. Um, female bisexuality is much easier, right? You can go, well, as long as a woman is sometimes attracted to men enough to have kids, then also being attracted to women it might be no cost at all, or it might even be a benefit in terms of social networking, making friends. Mm -hmm. Sex is a great way to make friends. Um, if a lot more males were bisexual, that would be equally easy to explain. Um, it's the exclusive homosexuality that's very hard to explain. It certainly exists. It exists at a, you know, a percentage that's much, much higher than you can explain as just, well, it's just mutations or it's just maladaptive. Mm -hmm. Like that won't work. So this is where I'll be kind of epistemically humble and say, man, I have no idea. Huh. It's, an, it's a fascinating problem. Maybe somebody will crack it within 10 or 20 years. Right. It's interesting because if you were coming at it from another perspective, like a religious mm -hmm. perspective, let's mm -hmm. say, you would find that to be mm -hmm. a moral quandary that then you could extrapolate yeah. all sorts of different judgments on. Yeah. But I can see the way you answer it. It's like, just is a thing. Yeah. Maybe we'll get more data on it, mm -hmm. but it is. But what do you make of the fact that there are seemingly mm -hmm. many more bisexual women where I don't know any gay couple that one of the guys is mm -hmm. sneaking out at night to bang a right. woman. You know right. what I mean? I've, yeah. I've never heard of that. But yep. you have heard of obviously straight mm -hmm. couples where the mm -hmm. guy is, mm -hmm. you know, on the DL or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my girlfriend Diana Fleischman has a whole theory of female bisexuality that's that's to do with the, the social networking benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but then the question is, yeah, why don't the men do that too? Because like if if you're a guy and you kind of swing both ways, then like doing gay sex can be a great way to make male friends also. And it's... Well, now I know we have our, uh, our promo for the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so in a way, the quandary isn't why do any male homosexuals exist? The quandary is why aren't all males and females bisexual? Mm -hmm. And do you think some of that years from now, we might look back and go, whoa, that's just societal pressure? It might be. I think certainly there's a huge amount of stigma against male bisexuals from both sexes, mm -hmm. um, but especially women. Um, female bisexuality used to be stigmatized maybe 30 years ago, not so much anymore. Yeah. So it, that could change. 
What, what are some of the other topics that are that are really on your mind these days? Let, let's hit up. Effective altruism? Things. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've had many guests on talking about effective altruism, but not, it's... Not a ton, actually. It, it's sort of my hot topic of the last few years. So it, it's a social movement, a, a moral movement. It's some of the smartest young people I've ever met, and their basic goal in life is do the most good they can based on reason and evidence rather than sentimentality and virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. I've done a little bit of this sort of in an ancillary way with some mm -hmm. of the libertarians that I've yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. And so the kind of major domains they tend to focus on are things like how do we get charities to be more effective at reducing global poverty or promoting global public health? How do we overcome factory farming and be nice to animals and promote animal welfare. And so a lot of the effective altruists are vegan um, for ethical reasons. And then a lot of them are focused on just survival of the species. How do we reduce existential risks to humanity like nuclear war, bioweapons, um, and artificial intelligence risks? So maybe the most distinctive thing they have is this kind of ultra long-term perspective. That's like, we are just these transient little beings. The thing that really matters is what does humanity turn into? How long do we last? Do we colonize the universe or do we fail? And the folks who think most seriously about that think, it's actually that last thing, minimizing existential risk that is absolutely crucial and everything else is just kind of fluff and bullshit. So is this where like the transhumanist mm -hmm. crew would sort of fit within mm -hmm. this? Is there a risk? So I love this stuff because I'm a sci-fi guy. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Philip K. Dick before. I mean, every yeah. one of his stories or books are about the inevitability mm -hmm. of all of these things. Is there a risk though of always looking mm -hmm. at what's beyond the horizon instead mm -hmm. of going on right now? I don't really think there's a risk unless like the vast majority of humans became effective altruists. There's already so many people who are obsessed with, um, you know, diversity and equity and inclusion and economic growth and all the ordinary problems that politicians talk about. Like that's covered. There's already a lot of smart people working on that. The, the big neglected topics tend to be the kind of science fiction -y topics where you need a sort of cadre of genius Aspies, <laughs> right, to work on it when nobody else is taking it seriously. Yeah, well, speaking of the Aspies, that's, that's an mm -hmm. interesting one if we wanted to get into one that's mm -hmm. a, little, a little controversial as well. Um, what, what is that all about mm -hmm. that so many of the creators mm -hmm. now or mm -hmm. the people that are coming out of the tech world, even though you can obviously make plenty of arguments that the tech mm -hmm. world is now in a sort of implosion and certainly not the creative place it was, yeah. say, 10 years ago, but that so much creativity came out of a world that had so many people that were seemingly uncreative. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating. Um, I sort of identify as moderately Aspie myself, kind of high-functioning Asperger's, and I've written some stuff about how... Um, neurodiversity issues like being Aspie kind of rub up against free speech issues. Because like Can you explain that over? people who are Aspie don't always do a good job of understanding the beliefs and desires of other people and particularly what they might find offensive, mm -hmm. right? So they might just say something. So they might just say sh whatever. shit and then yeah. be really surprised that it was distressing to someone. And so if you have a model of speech that says you must never cause offense, that assumes you can anticipate what will cause offense. And a lot of people can't anticipate that because mm -hmm. their brains don't work that way. So you either need to say, okay, Aspies, you can never say anything, or cut them some slack and say, we understand you'll offend people once in a while, but that's okay because that's your, just that's part of your deal. Man, I've never thought about this, but does this somehow explain what's going on in Silicon Valley right now? You have a bunch of people mm -hmm. who are somewhat socially awkward, let's say, yeah. who created incredible technology that allowed us to all connect, 
But then when voices that aren't supposed, mm -hmm. aren't supposed to, that's a horrible way of framing it, when voices that are a little out there or a little contrarian or whatever, that might yeah. include us actually, mm -hmm. get out there, the only way they can deal with it is to shut that voice off or something like that. Like, which yeah. is why we're seeing so much deplatforming and silencing. And the right, right, they have to be overly systematizing about it. They, they have to be like, oh man, I can't, I can't navigate these gray areas mm. if I'm running a social media platform or Patreon or whatever. Right. So I'm going to just have a hard and fast rule that says, if I get enough complaints, I deplatform that person. Or um, I don't know the difference between porn and erotica and just slightly sexy art, so I'm going to say no nipples mm -hmm. or wh whatever. That's a kind of Aspie response to getting blowback from people where you, like, you don't really know why they're upset. So in a weird way, if you have a bunch of the creators of Silicon Valley that mm. are coming from that world, and then you suddenly bring in a bunch of executives that come from the social justice world, mm -hmm. that really shows like a, a, that's a match made in hell right It's there. just matter, antimatter. Yeah, it's, um, it's terrible. And what I hoped would happen is that Maybe five or ten years ago, it seemed like huh, like tech is dominating culture generally, and tech is dominated by Aspies. So hopefully Aspie values uh -huh. of being kind of tolerant and eccentric and nerdy and like getting weird little enthusiasms, that that would kind of trickle down and create a more tolerant hmm. culture. Is that what you would have predicted, say, ten years ago? Yeah. Really? And instead, you have the opposite. You yeah. have the, the social justice activists taking over and basically saying, all of that quirky freedom that you, you Aspie people value, we're going to legislate that away. You, you can't have that. Um, and it's, it's tragic. I hope the pendulum swing, swings back, but um, as long as the leaders of the social media platforms don't have the guts to say, look, this is our people, um, outspoken, eccentric, slightly socially oblivious people, and that's okay. And the rest of you just have to kind of suck it up and deal with it. That's what they should be doing. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm at the point with all this, and you know how frustrated <clears throat> I've been with YouTube and Twitter and Patreon and the whole thing. I'm really at the point of this where I actually mm -hmm. believe that that solution is gone. Mm -hmm. I don't think it can come from the top anymore. Yeah. I, I really don't believe that. I think that thing mm -hmm. has become so corroded that I would say the mm -hmm. only way it can come is now from the bottom, mm -hmm. that the people will basically rise up against these things. And I know that's like, mm -hmm. it's sort of pie in the sky because what does that even mean? Do we all sign off on the same day? Do we all, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that means. But I almost see that as the only way to do this because they've had, We've done everything else, or, or the government will get involved, and mm. that certainly rings all the bells that I'm not happy with on my libertarian side. Yeah, I, I think at least in terms of universities, the only solution to, to some of the university problems is the government actually saying, at least to the public universities mm. that are in principle bound by the Constitution, you guys have to obey the First Amendment, yeah. or you lose federal funding. I think that's the only leverage. Yeah. And I was really kind of hoping that POTUS would do that at some point in the last year or two. I'm pretty disappointed that he hasn't. Mm -hmm. Well, but in a weird way, he almost benefits the more that they go against it, right? Yeah. Because that feeds his base of, yeah. of aggrieved and politically correct. Yeah. You know, that they see political correctness running amok. Yeah. Something like that. Um, all right, before we finish up, give me, give me one thing. We're at the beginning of 2019 right now. Mm -hmm. Give me one thing that we should be sort of thinking about that we're not mm -hmm. thinking about right now. I love the thought experiment of like, once Elon Musk succeeds and we start colonizing Mars, what, what are the relationships and social structures in the Mars colonies gonna look like? I'm fascinated by this, mm -hmm. this issue. Like, yeah, that's are, cool. are the colonies gonna be like communist utopias? Are they gonna be libertarian um, aspirational states? Are they is everyone going to do monogamous lifelong marriage? Is it going to be crazy, polyamorous, kinky stuff? I think it's great to think about 
this stuff before we attempt it. And I think Mars is going to be this amazing experiment where like this colony gets formed based on these social and sexual assumptions and this one gets formed and this one fails catastrophically mm -hmm. or or it just, like it doesn't work well enough and it just borrows the organization of this other place. So I think it'll be this incredible kind of behavioral science laboratory. And I can't Dare wait Dare I say that's not too far from the way the America was set up, right? That the states exactly. were supposed to be mm -hmm. those places of experiment. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's the way the East Coast was 200, 250 years ago. And I think um, the difference now is the colonies will be able to communicate with each other and with us and be able to measure a bunch of outcomes and deliberately experiment. And I think we need to kind of get out ahead of that and start like rereading all of our classic science fiction and figuring mm -hmm. out how is this going to apply for reals now, now that we do it. Yeah, which is so related to why you think art is important mm -hmm. because fiction is just as important. I mean, you realize it all ends with that eventually they figure it mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. they have their tea party, and then we blow them up. Like, yeah, but they do beautiful Art Nouveau <laughs> like domes in the meanwhile. Yeah, Jeffrey, I'm so glad we finally did this. Yeah, and let's do it again for sure. And if you want to see a good combination of bright, smart thought and snark on Twitter, follow mm -hmm. Jeffrey at Primal Poly.